a video on Kuhn and paradigms. What is a paradigm actually? And how is it that some paradigms seem to be better than others, even though they're supposed to be uncomparable? Just to reiterate, the, the main question we're dealing with here is how science actually evolves over time. Is it like a completely linear process? It's like building this Lego tower, you build brick by brick on top of each other, and, and previous science always helps us, always is a building block, or as the title of the book indicates, there are some revolutions in play. It's about the structure of scientific revolution. And in the end, this sort of historical question of how science develops is also a question about, is there in the end some kind of external objective truth that sets the standard for what is true or not in science? What is good science or not good science? So it's both this historical angle just simply in order to get to that question of, is there some kind of external objective final truth? And this example um, from Semmelweis is, is, is quite illustrative. I talked about it in class as well. We had a situation where lots of women, unfortunately, uh, died while giving birth. So we have the mortality rate here, as you can see, it's really quite high in some month and the x-axis we have time and all these numbers and circles is, is, is a month and and what Semmelweis at some point found out or realized was that hand washing was a good idea and it's quite obvious without doing a statistical analysis that something happened here the mortality rates are substantially lower um, clearly hand washing seemed to have made the difference but it wasn't just this, this practice wasn't like immediately spread around in the community um, among doctors or in the scientific uh, community. And, and, and Kuhn's paradigm concept is actually quite useful for, for making sense of that because people didn't know what a germ was. People didn't realize that you could have something on your hands if you can spread to others and then this something could make others um, very ill. It simply wasn't concept for that this wasn't part of the worldview it's not like making people understand that we should wash our hands more often than not or we should wash them for 20 seconds rather than just the four seconds that many people might do this is something that is sort of fairly easy to understand we know what hand washing does and then we might realize we don't really do it well enough this is from not knowing that it can make sense and not having a framework that enables it to make sense to suddenly having to do that. And this is where the paradigm concept comes into play. It tries to describe some fundamental fundamental assumptions and practices in a given scientific field that that shows why it's difficult to accept something completely new. So this is why the doctors back then had a difficult time of, of accepting this new idea. It just did not fit their worldview, their paradigm at all. So that's sort of the, the practical angle on why new explanations aren't always accepted. But Kuhn then also has this very fundamental um, explanation that also gets to there isn't actually any reality out there that is a simple standard for truth or falseness. And it's, for instance, highlighted in this quote here, we do not see electrons, but rather the tracks of bubbles of vapor in a cloud chamber. We don't see an electron. We see some stuff that we can make sense of. We have theories and, and, and materials and educations that make us realize that this is what we call an electron and we can predict the movement and we have scientific models that are really quite accurate. But you need to be Einstein or Bohr in order to make sense of all this. The regular stupid man like me wouldn't be able to, to tell just by looking at this picture. Um, so, as the quote here says, in the metaphorical, no less than in the literal use of seeing, interpretation begins where perception ends. Um, what perception leaves for interpretation to complete depends drastically on the nature and amount of prior experience and training. This is why Einstein can see something that I wouldn't. But this is also why Niels Bohr and Einstein, they could for decades look at the same data on electrons and atoms and be fundamentally in disagreement about um, some really, really important questions. And 
this physics angle, but of course the same point holds for whether it's motivation or firm performance, productivity, efficient market hypothesis. We don't see these things as such. It's not like a bottle of water or a table or something that is very tangible. We see stuff that we then interpret um, given our sort of history in a given scientific field. So rely on a paradigmatic lens, so to speak. We have some techniques and norms and ideas that helps us helps us interpret the future. So we don't have any easy, clear external truth, and we have a situation where we might have disagreement on um, how to interpret findings. And this is what led to the video that I showed in class. That I'm also inserted in the link here. That sometimes you get new input, new information that simply doesn't fit what we already think which is why the hand washing idea wasn't immediately accepted and which is why some physics ideas or economic economics ideas aren't immediately accepted and that's basically what the paradigm concept does it's trying to show what things what features and factors to pay attention to in order to explain and describe a given field and explain why it might not um, be willing to accept new perspectives and this is a lot of stuff going on in this slide here, but this is what this slide is then also showing that we can try to make sense of how the field of economics has changed over time. It used to be the case that we looked at really the purely symbolic world. We thought of supply demand changes and, and similar stuff. And, and we did some math and did some functions and, and drew some graphs because um, this is the economic world that we really focused on most of the 20th century. And then in recent times, we've realized that what for instance, with the minimum wage, it, it's not the case that raising the minimum wage decreases productivity and, and, and is a bad thing. Um, it's sort of supposed to is according to the more abstract conception, but empirical studies shows that it's not. This is not the case. Um, so what's going on here is that, that economics has shifted from looking at this sort of very mathematical approach to doing lots of empirical real-world studies. Mm -hmm. And, and and they've also then, this also implies they've used different techniques. This is what this different the, the, the picture in the bottom is indicating that we've gone from the mathematical abstract approach to doing experiments and empirical studies in, in the world. So I could sort of put in a bunch of additional angles to try to make sense of, well, how is the traditional conception of economics, how is that different from what is being done now? And then these examples and angles give an indication. But basically what Kuhn's paradigm concept is is doing is to say these are the four features that are really useful to keep in mind when we want to describe a field. And these features will then also explain why fields might struggle with taking in new perspectives and changing. So with the hand washing example, we had some kind of metaphysical paradigm about what, what world are we looking at? Germs don't exist. This is just not something that is part of the worldview. And if they don't exist, well, then we should, then, then it's sort of almost bound to ignore this information because it doesn't fit the paradigm. Um, and, and similarly, we, we, we can then look at the, the, the concept of exemplars and then say, well, this also really defines our field. What are we trying to test our theory on? Are we testing it on, on, on stock markets and, and, and how large firms behave? Or are we, for instance, focusing on the actions of, of, of poor people and, 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 and how minimum wage influences the world? Then we have a factor called values, which encompasses the covers of methods and techniques uh, that, that we use. Do we do, is the lab experiment something that is useful? Should we do field experiments? Can we just do, should we do longitudinal studies? And how important is it to predict what, 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 what constitutes good science and what should good scientists do um, to what degree should economists solve the current corona crisis and to what degree do we actually have the methods to predict the economic impact of, of various actions of closing down schools for instance um, so so basically these four different elements are an attempt of saying these are core features of a given scientific field and if we want to make sense of why and if um if a sort of a change is too much well it depends on how much it sort of goes against the typical uh, approach here 
and 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 you should not think that you're in an exam situation have to be able to identify each single individual element it's about understanding the overall thrust of what Kuhn is doing here so just in the last couple of minutes here this then also then leads to um, the question of how to compare different scientific approaches and paradigms as Kuhn is saying here there is no theory independent way of, of comparing for instance to disagreeing perspectives there's no real counterpart in nature that, that we can just point to and say look this is this is what is the truth so that sort of leads to the unfortunate situation that, that we can't say that something is better than another and that leads to relativism and how do we know that well why can't we just say that climate change is not man-made because what standard is there is there if there is no theory independent way of saying this science is better well this is how we this is where he then puts in the evolutionary principle that that we can say the theories and models that are better at predicting for instance that can solve more problems that constitutes better science these are the paradigms that will survive in the future so there is this survival of the fittest approach that we don't say that more true theories will survive in the future but more effective theories that are more that can solve more problems and that can predict the future these are um this is the, the, the approaches that should survive so he's saying there was no neutral standard because how could there be on the other hand he is saying that there is an evolutionary standard that can tell us what science is better so it's a little bit of a double standard um but i think he would argue that his evolutionary standard is not attached or dependent on any theory or method or time period it's it's really an, an, a timeless perspective on on, on, on a timeless efficiency perspective so this also then explains that, that within a paradigm we can say within a given field there are completely objective standards for what is the right thing to do it's a cross when when a science just completely changes that that we can't say that, that, that we can make these direct comparisons so it's when we compare across paradigms that the evolutionary component comes into play and just here at the end this then also means that it's quite difficult to put Kuhn in Buber's categorization because in some way he's saying this is his whole perception interpretation point that, that there is no theory independent way of making sense of the world we it's, it's it's constructed our theories are constructed but it's also saying there is some kind of objectivity standard um there is an objectivity there is a standard of an evolutionary standard that can tell us what approach is better than others so that's why he's sort of in the middle here between post-positivism and constructivism he wants to lean towards post-positivism but but he's also accused of being a relativist um, 